You're listening to the Based on History podcast. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives. But they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? Hello, and welcome back to the Based on History podcast. I'm your host, John Nidick, and welcome to the first Based on History mini. And what a mini is going to be is just, for it's for two things. One, two, for us to have put out more content for everybody to listen to, and two, to bring a little bit more historical context to the upcoming episode. So in a mini, we'll mainly just be talking about history and not necessarily about the film itself. But when we get to the next episode and you watch the movie and you're listening to the podcast, you'll have a little bit more historical context into what we're talking about. So I hope that y'all enjoy this. This is the first one. It may not be for every single one, but any movie that comes up where... I feel like, you know, people might enjoy hearing a little bit more historical context as to what is going on, especially when a movie focuses on such a small period of time versus like a long, long drawn out story so that people, when you dive into a movie and talking about the movie for a long time, you have some historical context and the small details and small events make a little bit more sense. So, and this podcast, or the, excuse me, the mini is not going to really deal with what goes on in the movie. Like I said, we're going to talk about some of the things that went on beforehand to give you and the listeners and everybody else a little bit of context as to why the British are in South Africa and why they're fighting against the Zulu kingdom and what's kind of going on there. So we're not going to dive into a ton of the older history, but we'll hit some, we'll hit some high notes And then we'll dive into what's known as the Ninth Cape Frontier War. And that's where we're going to see some of the players in the Anglo-Zulu War, how they got their start and why they made some of the decisions that they made during that war and how this affected what went on a little bit later. And some of the things that happened in the movie Zulu will make a little bit more sense with all of this in context. So when you look at the history of South Africa and why the English and the European uh, colonists and settlers are coming into conflict with these African kingdoms, you go all the way back to the forming of Cape Town in 1652 by the Dutch East India Company. And this is a trade stop on the way from, uh, excuse me, going from Europe to India and back. And there's a multitude of things that happen there. Uh, spices, slave trade, uh, a lot of things. And Cape Town is started out as just a port. And then settlers came to that area and they began to expand. And very soon after, these Dutch, German, Irish, and French settlers came to Cape Town, they started moving into the interior And, of course, there were already people living there, and there were kingdoms of varying degrees of animosity towards Europeans, and they became to come into conflict. And it was pretty continuous from the forming of Cape Town to the end of these uh, Anglo-Zulu wars and, and even going into the 20th century. So the Dutch settlers start moving into the interior, interior of the continent, and they run into these people known as the Hosa. And it's a group of tribes and chiefdoms, and and they're all related peoples. And each tribe and each group of them have their own names and and their own cultures and customs and things of that nature. But the collective group of people based around this language is are they're called the Hosa. And 
they came into conflict with them very early on and continue in and pretty much continuous continuously throughout the the history of what's known as these frontier wars or the Hosa wars and they go all the way through the late 1800s it's the longest military campaign of european colonization on the continent of africa and it takes roughly a hundred years for these people to be what we would say fully conquered or under British subjugation. And it reminds me a lot of the Indian wars in North America. They're a less technologically advanced society as we would as we would view it, but they last a very long time, all things considered. And they fight nobly, and they fight honorably, and there's atrocities on both sides of the thing. Nobody is without, you know, blame, and there's aggression on some sides, and there's aggression on the other later on. And some people, you know, some kids answer for the crimes of their fathers, right or wrong. But it's just, it reminded me a lot of some of the Indian wars in North America, and what you see as one chief kind of being held responsible for the whole entire tribe when really he's only in charge or responsible for his clan or you know a small group of people but something that his warriors do leads to an all-out war when it really didn't need to be that way because one person or one group of people viewed it the way they shouldn't have or they knew it was like that and they didn't care and they just used it as an excuse and you see that throughout all of this there's good and bad, and there's peaceful and aggressors on both sides, and this is a struggle for who's going to be in control. There's right and wrong across the board, and you, and you see it all the way through. But the one that we're going to focus on the most here is the Ninth Frontier War. So the early wars is going to be the Dutch and the Dutch settlers versus the Hosa. You see the Boers moving into the inland, and you see the great treks happening, and the the Boer settlers moving and forming their own states in the you know north of the Cape Colony. And then in the early 1800s, you see the British take control of the Cape Colony from the Dutch. This has to do with the Napoleonic Wars and things of that nature. But the British are down there in the early 1800s, and by 1814, they are in control of the Cape Colony. And now this brings Imperial Britain into the war. And from the fourth Hosa War on, you see the British involved in some way, shape, or form. Each of these wars varies in size and scale and death total, and some are more serious than others, and more. Le- and some of these wars lead to more serious implications on, uh, as a whole of you know South Africa than others. Some of them are more or less just border skirmishes. But over the course of all of these, you begin to steadily see Hosa lands diminishing. And by the time we get to this ninth one, there's really only one chiefdom of Hosa people left with a free kingdom. And that's the Kaleka people. The rest of them are either living in this land or they've been subjugated and are living in county, what we would call a county or area. Or they've moved off. They've moved off somewhere else. And so this is really the last Hosa independent kingdom that will fall at the end of this Ninth Frontier War. And there's a few things that lead to the start of the Ninth Frontier War. Then, First off, this war is going to take place between 1877 and 1879. And the reason this is important is because the Anglo-Zulu War starts off at the, at the end of this one. And so it's a, basically a continuation of this war, but the reason it's the Anglo-Zulu is that the Zulu are different people than the Hosa. And so the end of the Cape Frontier War is the end of the wars against the Hosa, and the British then go straight into the Anglo-Zulu War against the Zulu people. So the Ninth Frontier War comes after the Eighth Frontier War. And the Eighth Frontier War was known as one of the bloodiest and worst of the nine. A lot of people died, a lot of land was seized, and a lot of Hosa warriors were killed. And so there's, like I said, there's really only one kingdom left. One thing that happened during this time that is going to contribute to this Ninth ninth Frontier War uh, popping off is the Hosa people have prophets. And one of these prophets was this young girl, and in... 1856, she has a vision. And in her vision, 
the ancestors all come back and they kick all the Europeans out of South Africa and they establish the hosts of people's traditional regions again. And, you know, they establish this peace. They have this this peace under their risen dead ancestors. And the way that these ancestors are going to come back is if the hosts of people all burn all of their crops and kill all of their cattle. Because part of the deal is when their ancestors come back, they're going to bring with them their cattle and their food and they'll never go hungry again. It doesn't really take off, but then once the king hears that this young girl has prophesied these things, and for whatever reason, political or religious, he begins to kill his cattle and burn his crops. And then once the king does it, it takes off. The What's known as the cattle killing movement takes place between 1856 and in 1858, and they kill something like 400,000 head of cattle or something like that. I mean, it is disastrous uh, for the for the cattle population. They burn all their crops. Well, the date comes and goes, and there's no ancestors that appear. Well, they say, well, it's, not, it's because some people aren't killing all their, all their cattle, and some people aren't burning all their crops. So in between these so the, she prophesies another date so in between these two pr- uh, prophecy dates you see cattle killing peak even more and the second date comes and goes no more no ancestors come and now what they're left with is no cattle no crops no way to feed themselves and that's one of the ways that you viewed the wealth in these Hosa communities is by how many cattle you had so You've basically destroyed the economic, you know, hierarchy of this community as well as the way they feed themselves. And so you have massive starvation, tons of people die, and they have to go elsewhere to find food. Now, this contributes to the ability to maintain peace in the area because this once powerful nation, they're not powerful anymore, uh, at least within the Cape Colony. And so all of these people are looking elsewhere for food and work, and they have to you know, find it where they can. The Cape Colony begins to establish a semi-independent rule from, from Britain under a government of good faith, uh, so to speak. And they're running things fairly well, and this cattle-killing movement contributed to that because these people that were in opposition to the Cape Colony are now coming to them, or at least their people, maybe not on a government level, but on an individual level, they're coming to the Cape Colony settlers and looking for food and looking for work. And so the Cape Colony does a couple things to help establish peace and be able to govern this area well. And one of them is they start using a combined mixed race Mounted police force, and this is mixed up of Cape Boers, Fengu people, which is an African tribe that has been assimilated into the Cape Colony, the Hosa people, and a few other tribes. And so you've got this mixed race of people all being represented within the authority of the Cape Colony. You'll also see the Cape Colony start to recognize indigenous people's property rights, which is a big thing that's going on. So there's this kind of uneasy peace that's starting to happen, but at the same time, Britain is starting to get more involved, and we're going to talk about that in just one second. But the Cape Colony is saying to the British politicians, like, your involvement will only make things worse here. We finally have some peace. We're finally getting some good rule. The people are starting to be happy again, and we have peace. They say that the British involvement is unnecessary and ill-advised. Now, the reason that the British are starting to want to get more involved into the Cape Colony politics is that a man named Bartle Freer is made the High Commissioner and Governor of South Africa. And he is coming down there with a plan, and that plan is to create a South African confederacy the way the British have just done with Canada. And what he needs to be able to do that is to basically conquer all the independent kingdoms in South Africa to create this confederacy. Now, you don't just have the Cape Colony down there. You've got the Cape Colony. You've got the Hosa 
Kaleka land, which is still independent. A little farther to the northeast, you've got Zulu land, which is definitely independent at this time. And you've got two Boer republics up there. You've got the Orange Free State, and then you've got the Transvaal Republic. And so his goal is to take all of these independent states and form the South African Confederacy under British law. He is looking for any reason to, and the way, sorry, the way he's going to do this is through warfare. For, so that England can come in there, they can put imperial troops on the ground, conquer these places, and say, all right, now you're part of the Confederacy. Now you're under British rule. And so he's looking for any and every excuse to get British imperial troops on the ground in South Africa involved in a war. And things happen, and he is trying to use them as excuses, and the Cape Colony politicians are saying, no, you don't need to be here. This is a local issue, not an imperial issue. We don't need your troops here to make things worse. It's going to make them worse. And so there's a struggle between the local politicians and the imperial politicians to uh, who's got more you know, sway over the, over the area. So what really gives Freer the opportunity to put imperial troops in play is this is the small bar fight at a local wedding between the Hosa people and this tribe known as the Fengu. And, and there's a fight. Now, the Fengu are, are another tribe in South Africa. They assimilated fairly well into what we would say European standards, and they were known as good fighters, they're good horsemen, they're good shots, and they were known as a steadfast ally of the Cape Colony through all through a lot of these wars. So the Hosa didn't really like them very much, and that's kind of where some of this conflict uh, comes from. The Cape Colony sees this as a local issue. Once Freer hears about this, he's licking his chops. He sees his, He tries to make this as big a deal as he possibly can. And he calls a war council. Well, while this war council is being on, the Hosa have got together a, a, an army, about 8,000 people, and they're raiding the frontier. They're burning settlements. They're attacking Fengu houses, and, and people are dying. But the Cape Colony, st- Cape Colony still sees it as a local issue. They're going to dispatch their local commandos, the people that the people, the military that the people respect, to take care of this Hosa problem. They also know that if they don't take care of it, the British are going to get involved, and they don't want imperial oversight over their what they consider their local ongoing day-to-day life. And so there's this time period where the Cape Colony is trying to move as quickly as possible to keep the British from getting involved, and the British are moving as quickly as possible so that they have an excuse to get involved. So Freer calls this war council. He has representatives there. And the Cape Colony has representatives there, and they're kind of going back and forth on this struggle of how are the British going to be involved. While this happens, the Cape Colony dispatches their commandos to take care of this Hosa army. And they have, they, we don't know how many men they have, but this commando is a mixed race, mixed race group of men. They break up into three pronged attacks, or excuse me, they break up into three columns, and they catch up with this Hosa army, and they utterly destroy them. Then they break up into three columns and go through Kaleka land and mop up anybody else who's causing trouble. They establish peace back on the frontier. They ride through the entire land and kind of put down any rebellion or any group of people who's causing trouble and establish peace. The whole thing takes less than three weeks. Well, Freer is not going to let it go. He uses that as an excuse and starts doing some reforms. And one of these reforms is that he, he passes a law saying that no black man in, in the Cape Colony can be armed. Which is crazy because they've got allies who are indigenous black Africans fighting for them who just helped put down this rebellion and then... This British high commissioner says, you're not allowed to carry a a gun anymore. Well, you have all of these different militias. They all desert. They all run away. And then you have the British general, Cunningham, trying to enforce these laws on the local people. And there's more resistance than there was 
before this ninth frontier, you know, ninth frontier war, I'm using air quotes there, had even started. And he he probably knows this, but he essentially creates this ninth frontier war out of nothing after it had just been stamped out in less than three weeks. It was seen as a border dispute, a local border dispute. It was put down and stopped as a local board, border dispute. You saw the Kaleka land chief. He was already ready for peace. He wasn't trying to invade or establish, you know, uh, gain any more territory. And so it was. It was seen as a frontier dispute that had been settled. And Freer passes these, these, these laws and creates a bigger problem than already was there, which may have been his goal in the first place. So you see more Kaleka people rebel. They start forming their army again. And then you see another group of people who I know I'm going to get this name wrong, but the, we'll just go with the Gika. If I get that wrong and someone knows, you can comment on how to actually say it. And their leader, St. Dili, rebel as well. So now instead of just having one group of people, you've got multiple group of peoples who are forming up for war against the Cape Colony and the British imperialists. So you've got all of these Hosa people forming these kind of ragtag armies now. And they're raiding all up and down the frontier. A lot of people are killed. And... This is definitely what Freer uses as to get Imperial troops down there. The Imperial troops go into Kaleka land, and they can't find anyone. The Hosa people are there too quick. They know the area too well, and the British are mainly infantry, and they have a horrible time. They have a horrible go of it. They don't listen to their local intelligence. Their supply lines are stretched thin. They can't move quick enough. It's extremely hot and humid all over the place. People are going down with sickness and those th- and things like that. The British are overconfident. They don't protect their supply lines. They're getting ambushed all over the place in these little skirmishes. And the British Imperial troops are almost useless. Now, they c- the British get lucky here because they have some local troops still under retainer, which is weird because most of them didn't want to help the British after they passed all those laws taking away their weapons. But they have some Fangu and Boar commandos that are helping them out. And they have the, in January, they find the Hosa and they're able to engage them in a pretty serious battle called the Battle of Umoxa. And they're, the British Imperial troops are essentially useless during the battle. They're tired, they're worn out. And it's really the Fangu troops and the Frontier Light Horse that win the, win the battle for them. The next month in February, there's another battle that the British troops are completely worn out. They're attacked by the Hosa, and it's pretty much everything they can do to not be overrun. But again, the Fangu and the Frontier Light Horse save them and beat back the attack. Now... This ends up being a pretty decisive win for the Imperial troops overall because you see the Kaleka surrender after this battle. And there's a few of them that go rogue and, run, and, and stay in the field. But the Kaleka, who are the last remaining kingdom of the Hosa, surrender. But the, I'm going to try and say it again, the Gika and their leader who were not even in rebellion in the first place until these laws were passed, stay stay out in the field. And they retreat into what's known as the Amatola Mountains. And it's an extremely rugged area. It's extremely mountainous. They've got all of these... It's like a forest, but, but it's an impassable forest. And they retreat into the Amatola Mountains. And so the British have to go into this area to round up the last of the rebels so that the war can end, but they can't. The same problems they had in Kalekaland, they're having in the Amatola Mountains, except it's even worse. The The forests are too thick, the area is too mountainous, and they're mainly infantry. Their supply lines are spread too thin, they're getting ambushed all over the place, and they can't, they can't catch them. Once again, they go in there overconfident, they're, they don't protect their supply lines, they don't listen to local in- intelligence, and it the it's a the rest of the year is spent just wandering around in these woods, getting ambushed, and nothing else really changes. Finally, 
the British begin to implement the local strategy, which was suggested to them from the get-go, and that is that they take the area of the Amatola Mountains and of some of the surrounding area, and they split it up into 11 military districts. And then they put kind of a stronghold or a couple strongholds in each of these districts, and they have a mounted, well-supplied garrison in each of them. When any of these Hosa rebels would attack or do a raid or go out or be sighted, whatever military district they're in would go out to respond and then send riders to the two districts that touch them that, hey, be ready, these people could be moving into your area. Whatever district the Hosa were in, they would pursue them to the edge, the border of the next district, and then that district would take over the pursuit until they were either caught or captured or there was a battle or whatever it was. This turns out to work extremely well. And it's not long after that, that the rest of these men are either, they either surrender or they're caught, killed in small raids and they're chased down and everything like that. And the leader of these war. And the difference is that the Hosa and the Zulu are very different people. The Hosa have had extreme contact with Europeans for over a hundred years now. Some of the assimilation has happened. Some of it is still more traditional and more tribal. But when you get to these, especially the last frontier wars, there's a lot of guerrilla warfare in there. And they're in these areas that are hard to get to and they're hard to find them. And, And the British really find out that bringing them to battle is one of the hardest things that they can do. They're smart, they're cunning, they're using the terrain, they're hiding, it's quick strikes. And so the British don't, or they, I mean, they find out that it's a prolonged guerrilla warfare. And so one of the things they're worried about when they go fight the Zulu is that they're not going to be able to find them and bring them to battle. But when they do, they're going to crush them because they're more technologically advanced. Well, as we come to find out, the Zulu are not as hard to find as the Hosa. The Zulu have a different culture, a different military tradition that was started with Shaka, and there's reasons why the Zulu are much more geared towards, you know, uh, direct confrontation and than the Hosa would be. But you're going to see that some of these things that they learned from these Hosa wars, you can't necessarily apply all of them to the Zulu wars. And it's going to be a major problem for the British, and they're going to run into some major, major defeats. Once they figure it out, there's not a whole lot the Zulu can do. But you can see how this over or this underestimation of your tribal, you know, enemy. It's like, oh well, we beat the host of this way and the Zulu are just gonna be the same. You know, it's very imperialistic to group group them all together. Well, that is kind of the end for the first based on history mini. I hope it was insightful. It wasn't too, too deep. It was a little bit broad, but it's really just to bring in some context for what's coming up with the Anglo-Zulu War, which begins almost immediately after this war. So after the end of this Ninth Frontier War, Bartle Freer, who's now the High Commissioner of South Africa, he's demolished the Cape Colony um, politicians. So he's almost the sole ruler of Africa. He begins looking for excuses on the Zulu kingdom that he did on the last Hosa kingdom. And when little things, border skirmishes and things like that happen, he is going to move on them quickly and not let up on them until he is able to declare war on the Zulu kingdom. And some border disputes happen and Freer issues these ultimatums, this list of like 13 different requirements that the Zulu kingdom must meet to prevent warfare from from breaking out. And when you read this list, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's no way that any of these things could have been met. When you look at the the terms of this ultimatum that that Freer gives to the Zulu king, it's things like surrender of of one of their chiefs to be tried in the Natal courts and the entire Zulu army has to be disbanded. 
and you have to pay this many cattle for this uh, instance. You need to pay this many cattle for this thing that we found that you did. And you have to allow all of these missionaries back in. And there has to be a British commissioner allowed to make sure that you're following all these rules. I mean, it's just ridiculous stuff that when you're a king of a kingdom and you're, an independ and you're independent of these British and you just look at these things and you say, well, no, you're not in charge of us. We can do what we want. And then when you when when the Zulu king doesn't follow these this ultimatum from Freer, Freer goes, Oh yes, well, he's breaking all these laws that he's agreed to. Now we can now you know, now we can invade. And it's just he's also using the the time it takes for messages to go and come back from London to his advantage. He's he'll send a message to London which has to go by boat and then by telegraph. And say, this is happening, this is happening, and this is happening. And before London can get a response to advise him on what to do, he's moving troops into places and telling them to do things and like that. And then he gets a response from London and says, oh, well, this is already happening. This is, you know, and then writes them and goes and does whatever he wants anyways. It is pure British imperialism at its finest. And they're moving, and he's moving as quickly as he can through South Africa. He got there in 1877, and very shortly after that, he started the Ninth Frontier War against the Hosa. And the frontier, the Ninth Frontier War, ends in 1879, and that's the same year that the Anglo-Zulu War starts out. So he's not wasting any time at all trying to establish this South African Confederacy, which is his whole goal is that because he sees himself as the high governor of the South African Confederacy under British imperialism. So I hope that gives a little bit of context to what's coming up in the movie Zulu. Uh, I got to do a lot of research and learn some things I didn't know. We didn't dive in too, too deep, but just to give a little bit more broader context of understanding why the British are in there, why they're making some of the moves they're making. And when you watch it, you'll be like, okay, well, that makes a little bit more sense now and just give you some broader context and things like that. Don't forget to like and subscribe us on Instagram. Follow us and subscribe to all of the podcast platforms that you're listening on. I hope you enjoy this first Based on History Mini and be on the lookout for Episode 3, focusing on the movie Zulu. All right.